everybody. Thanks so much for joining us. I am Jared. I have the joy of getting to be the senior pastor, these wonderful people known as Grace Community Church. And you could be anywhere doing anything right now, but you chose to be with us. Thank you. You are a gift. Let me pray, and then we will land our series on Family Feud. So let's pray together. Lord, thank you for all who are joining us for such a time as this. And Holy Spirit, we need your help in the matters of family. So speak deeply to our hearts and to our confusion and our questions and our traumas and our dramas, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, I learned years ago from police friends that the most dangerous scenario they can be called to are domestic scenarios, domestic issues, domestic conflicts, family. Because family brings out the best in us, but it can bring out the very worst in us as well. So I want to go ahead and provide a couple of tools for you. You know, preaching, teaching about family, it's really, really complex, and there are so many angles and scenarios and relationship issues from all kinds of experiences. So with it being impossible for me to cover everything, though I like to try to, I want to give you a couple of tools to go to for reference and that can take you a little further. First, a, a big tool I would offer to you is Dr. Henry Cloud's website, drcloud.com. Now, we'll keep these up throughout the message, so you'll see them throughout, but drcloud.com. Dr. Henry Cloud, he is the guru of relationships and navigating relationships, relationship conflicts and unhealthy relationships, how to maintain a great relationship in every kind of form and fashion. So drcloud.com, go there. You can listen to his podcasts. You can read his blog posts. You can see other resources he points you to as well. He has Facebook communities. All of that is right there for you, drcloud.com. Secondly, I want to provide this hotline.org for you, the hotline.org in terms of national domestic violence and the hotline for it. You know, sadly, there has been an uptick of domestic violence during this time of quarantine. And so if you find yourself in that kind of horrible scenario, the hotline.org gives you a place to go where you can call a hotline, you can find some help, next steps. And again, we'll keep that on for you and anybody else who joins us later. So there you go. I hope you'll find that beneficial throughout. So let's dig into where we were last week. We talked about before in a conflict and feuding with family and even others, you have to deal with yourself before you discuss with them. Deal with you before you discuss with them. So last week was about us first dealing with ourselves and coming to a place of peace best we can before God and in our own spirit. So peace. And here was the outline of where we went. You got to pray first, pray first before you take any other measures of communicating, examine yourself to see what's triggered within you and navigate that. Acknowledge your emotions. Don't bury them. Own them and what they are. Give them to God. Control your reaction. You cannot control the result, but you can control your reaction. In an an argument, in a conflict, you can't control the result, but you can control your reaction. We talked about that. And then finally, Empty your ego, empty your pride. There's a lot there. You can go back last week and, and listen to it and watch it, and it prepare you actually for this week. For this week, we're getting into how not only to find peace, but then to step into being a person of peace as far as it's up to you and me to be a peacemaker. We see this in a passage in Romans where the Apostle Paul says, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. I love that passage because it says, if it is possible, meaning it's not always possible. So if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, you're not depending on them, you're not waiting for them, but as as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. So what we're after is not just peace, but being a peace maker, a peacemaker. So here's what I did for you. Last week, we unpacked peace in the the practical ways of dealing with ourselves. And this week, it's about being a peacemaker. Now I've dealt with me, and it's time for me to step out and discuss with them the issue, the hurt, the pain, 
the conflict. So peace in this week, maker. Yo, I've worked really hard at this, all right? I'm trying to make this as easy for us as possible to remember it. I know some of you love this kind of thing, the peace acronym. Now we have a maker acronym. Hopefully we can take this and apply it more easily as a tool in which we move forward to navigate. So there you go. All right, so first, let's just jump right in. First, make the effort. Make the effort. That's your first step. After you deal with you, you discuss with them by making the effort to, to go to them. You know, relationships are hard, man. They're hard. They're, they're stressful. They're painful. That's why we began last week with pray first, depending on the Holy Spirit, being filled by the Spirit, then the strength of the Spirit, the courage of His Holy Spirit in us to go make the effort. If you see any relationship that seems to be running on all eight cylinders, it looks to you and me to be a great relationship. That means, because, that means underneath is because they've done a lot of work. They've navigated a lot. They've made the effort to communicate, to bring things out in the open, to work through them, to make the effort. Now, make the effort in terms of what? You make the effort in terms of, of peace. And it's not settling for a false peace. It's really easy. This is why we got to make the effort past false peace. If you have false peace in a, in a home or any relationship, false peace because you're not dealing with the issues, it's not, it's not a true relationship. It's more of an illusion. So sometimes we've got to disrupt the peace, things that are being buried, swept under the rug, to get to true peace. And how does that look? Jesus talks about this in Matthew chapter 5 and Matthew chapter 18 when he talks about if you remember you've sinned against someone, don't bury it, don't act like it didn't happen. And if someone sinned against you, don't bury it and act like you didn't ha it didn't happen and move on. That's false peace. No, it's to get to true peace and health and healthy relationships. So let's see what Jesus said. First of all, in Matthew chapter 5, verses 23 and 24, he says this. If you are presenting a sacrifice at the altar in the temple and you suddenly remember that someone has something against you, leave your sacrifice there at the altar. Go and be reconciled to that person, then come and offer your sacrifice to God. A few thoughts here. He says, if you're there and you remember, meaning it's something that has actually happened and you know it has happened. You know you did it. It's not you wondering, did I do something? They're acting strangely toward me. I wonder if there might have been something I said. Is it something I did? No, no, no. This is a fact. You remember the fact that there was a fault. There was something you did or said that was something against them. When you get to that fact, it says to leave the place of sacrifice. That means where you are convicted in that place of conviction. Don't bury it. Don't put it off. When you're convicted about it for the sake of the relationship and your conscience, go. Go, and as far as it's up to you, if it is possible, to make peace, to be reconciled. And then come and offer your sacrifice to God. Come with a clear conscience. Live with a clear conscience. So we have communion today, right after the service. Uh, I hope you'll stick around for communion as we share in that together and we could look at communion like this and say, yeah, before I share in communion today, I might need to go to someone, call someone, or sit down with my husband, my family, my kids, or my parents, and work through a way that I have hurt them or what I've said to them. And I know it as a fact to work through it for the sake of the relationship and my conscience as we serve, as I serve the Lord. And as you go to them, very practical things. You don't start with, sorry if I hurt you. Don't, don't start there. It begins with, here's what I did to offend you and hurt you. Here's what I said, and I realize it, and I'm sorry. I'm sorry that I did it, and I said it. Will you forgive me? So going to them in such a way. Now, could it backfire? And you go to them about it, and they start uh, ranting at you and pointing out other things in you could happen. These are not perfect. These are this, th these are not promises. These are principles, and it's messy. The key is, as far as it's up to you, go to them, and your heart being in the right place. That's where it matters. So that's if you've sinned against someone. Now, what if someone sinned against you? Matthew chapter eighteen, verse fifteen. Jesus says, "If your brother, your sister, your family, you could say, sins against you." Go and tell him or her their fault between you and him or her alone, 
And if, she or, if he or she listens to you, you have gained them. You have gained a renewed relationship with them. So a few thoughts on this. First of all, it says if they have sinned against you. Sinned against you. It's not just an offense. It's not that you are being too sensitive, but there's a legit sin that has happened against you. It says to go and tell them their fault. In other words, don't wait for them to come to you. We can't say, well, they know what, they're, what they did and they need to come to me. Mm-mm. No, if we're going from the principle of what Jesus says, it's up to you and me, if we've been sinned against, to go to them. And notice it says to go alone. Go alone. This is not to be broadcast. This is not go and find some sympathy with another group of people or even other family. No, it's between you and them alone to go. And if they listen, and they may not listen, but if they listen, the hope is you have gained, you have renewed, you have reconciled with that person. So you don't wait for them to come, you go to them. You don't text them about it. You definitely don't lecture them about it as you go. Also, it talks about uh, if they sinned against you, go and tell him his fault. Notice it doesn't say go and tell him his faults because it's going to be really easy, even, to, even in how they respond, they could respond in a harsh kind of way where you up the ante of not just speaking toward the fault itself, but faults, even the fault of their character. Don't go there. You stay that, on that specific fault to deal with it before them. And you go not in a sense of wanting to punish, but in a sense of peacemaking, not punishing peacemaking, not revenge, but restoring the relationship, restoring the relationship. And here's the thing too, here's why we should go, because the person may not even know that they sinned against you and we're making assumptions about the relationship or maybe they, maybe you heard something from someone else and it might not be true, but now you have a view of them having sinned against you when they really didn't. And how will you know unless you go to them? You can be assuming something that's not true, and now you're kind of living out a lie in the relationship. There's, it's not based, there's an untruth within it. So that's another reason why you and I should go. I think of Proverbs 18, 13. It says, to answer before listening is folly and shame. So go and, go and listen to see if the conclusions you're having are really true. All this is for the health of a relationship And this is hard. That's why it's make the effort. It's so easy to think they should come to me. It's so easy to push it to the side. It's hard. So he says, make the, Jesus is saying, make the effort. Make the effort if we truly care about the relationship. Secondly, not only make the effort, but allow vulnerability. And that speaks to you and me as as you and I go. It's if I'm going, it's I'm going to go and risk being vulnerable because I love the person in the relationship. Here's where we see a principle on this with the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Listen to Paul's heart here. And this is kind of a conflict within, or there is a conflict in that Corinthian church, and Paul has had to say some strong things. So there's a bit of a conflict between them. But listen to Paul's words. He says, Oh, dear Corinthian friends, we have spoken honestly with you, and our hearts are open to you. There is no lack of love on our part, but you have withheld your love from us. I am asking you to respond as if you were my own children. Deep, deep relationship. Open your hearts to us. What a heart that Paul has. He said, we have spoken honestly with you. Or we're open to you. We've, we're coming to you Honestly, meaning we've even shared some honest things that were not easy for you to hear. But we don't want our relationship to be based on an illusion. So we've spoken honestly and we're open. Please open your heart to us. That's allowing vulnerability. And what's beautiful about approaching someone, allowing vulnerability, is as you and I lead the way, it opens the door for them to feel safe. You know, I learned this week that the first three minutes of a conversation determines how that's going to go and how it's going to end. Matter of fact, there's the, the, a scientific fact in terms of relationships in the, in the psychological wor- world that the way you begin a conversation shows 94% of the time how that conversation is going to land. So if you begin in a way that you're not vulnerable and instead defensive or angry, 94% of the time it's going to end with not being vulnerable and defensive and angry. But if you come allowing vulnerability, the odds are in your favor and in my favor 
that it could lead to someone opening their heart to us. Now, is that a promise? No, but it is a principle. You, got, you have God in it when you and I go in such a way. So say their reaction is negative and they have a harsh response back as you've risked yourself, and it is a risk to open your heart and to be vulnerable. Well, you can still respect and give them space in how they want to respond. If they don't respond the way you had hoped and even harsh, you can still be present. What you're after is a reset of the relationship. That's why we're coming, why you would go vulnerable. You don't want to go tit for tat in the relationship with who did what and why. No, you're coming to be vulnerable. I'm opening my heart to you and hopefully opening the door for you to open your heart. This is, a, this is a define the relationship kind of time with that person, whether it's marriage, whether it's children to parent, parent to children. It could be a, a roommate. It could be a best friend. This applies in all kinds of categories. But it's kind of a define the relationship moment where you're saying, can we open our hearts to each other and see if we agree on where we are in this relationship? Are, are we on the same page in terms of the goals we hope for in the relationship, that we're pulling in the same direction in terms of this relationship? And I'm coming to you and opening my heart to you. And a lot of times what I've learned, even in my experience, is it comes down to expectations. I learned recently that one of the biggest issues in relationships is failing to manage expectations, ex express ex expectations, and live up to expectations, even expectations that people have of you that you don't even know about or that you have of others and they don't know about those expectations from you. I, I came across this article yesterday, in fact, and this, this teaching today is not just marriage, all right? Remember, it's marriage and, and parents and children, children and parents and best friends and roommates. It can all apply. But this was a marriage thing on managing expectation. And the article is called The Man Who Coaches Husbands on How to Avoid Divorce. Really, really interesting. Uh, he faced a divorce years ago, and here's some things he shared. He shared that he, he, he discovered too late that he had left almost all the ch household, chore, household chores and child care to his wife. He said that my wife wanted a partner. She didn't want to be my mother. He talked about how he would leave a drinking glass by the dishwasher inches from the dishwasher but wouldn't put the glass into the dishwasher and how slowly over time that became, came from a pebble to a boulder in their relationship. And here's what he quotes about his wife. He says, It felt like to her that not taking four seconds to put my glass in the dishwasher is more important to me than you are. He said that's what it was like that the dishwasher was more important to him than four seconds to putting in the dishwasher to honor his wife. So what happened there? Ex expectations. There was an expectation that he would put his glass in the dishwasher, right? And, that, and, and, and they're broader than that. But it's managing expectations often in a relationship and being vulnerable, being vulnerable about what those expectations might be and, and voicing them, speaking them, agreeing to them even. So expectations. Now, there can be a more extreme piece of this where there's a flat-out rejection of you and or me when we're being vulnerable. And that's the scary part of it, isn't it? The rejection, the refusal, the blame shifting, maybe even as you try to open your heart and work things out. Here's what's been helpful as I've studied this and read over this and read some of Dr. Cloud's content, things like this, that it's up to the person in the relationship with you. It's up to them to process their disappointment. You don't do that for them. That's a, a mature thing for them to own their feelings, process their own disappointment, not blame you, look at themselves, open themselves to that. That's not on you. That's on them to do so. You cannot solve their part of the problem. They have to see it and own it for themselves. Now, you're sensitive to their feelings, as we all should be in relationships, but you're not responsible for their feelings. This is really helpful to me. There's a difference between responsibility to them and responsibility for them. Now, you have a responsibility to them because of the relationship. You love them. You're close to them. You want to maintain a, a, a true relationship, not a relationship on illusion. You want depth. You want closeness. So there's a responsibility to them, but there's not a responsibility for them. 
You're not responsible for their feelings and what they're, what they're dealing with. You're not responsible for their disappointments. It's, it's on them to own it. Because if you base decisions on their feelings, then you will, also, you will be kind of dragged around by their, their feelings instead of them owning it for themselves. You won't go for what is right and what is true, and you'll go more for how you'll appease their feelings. So that's a lot to process right there. But all of that needs to flow out of this vulnerability. vulnerability. So are you making the effort to go And then are you leading with vulnerability as far as it's up to you, as far as it's possible to do so, to maintain a healthy or get back to a healthy relationship? Now, from there, what if it all goes wrong? It just continues to get worse. It's wrong. You can't get your bearings. Well, that's where we get to the third piece here on Peacemaker, and that is to know your boundaries, to set boundaries, even in that relationship in the home. This is where drcloud.com will help you as it helps me and Christy and our family is to really navigate scenarios here. And I can't cover all scenarios. Let me give you some thoughts of how Dr. Cloud approached this that was really helpful. Someone can say they're sorry, yet never change. They can say they're sorry over and over and over again, yet never change. That's where you need to have boundaries. Boundaries doesn't mean you're not being loving, because that can sound harsh, but it is true to do so. And we'll see this go forward right here. Proverbs 22, verse 3. Watch what the wise man says. He says, sensible people will see trouble coming and avoid it, but an unthinking person will walk right into it and regret it later. This can go for relationships. This can go for even in the home. You're not to subject yourself to abuse. If we go really extreme abuse, no, that's abandonment, and you need to get away and find help. Thus, the hotline there for you. You can see trouble coming and avoid it by someone who keeps saying they're sorry, but they're not changing in all kinds of different ways. We're given this principle that if you see that kind of trouble to 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 set a boundary between you and that person in a loving sort of way. So what do we mean by boundaries? When a relationship becomes unhealthy, it could be that the only way you get their attention is to create space from them until they deal with that problem issue. Let me, let me quote that again. Boundaries. When a relationship becomes so unhealthy then it may be the only way that you're going to get their attention is to create space and boundaries until they deal with the problem issue. And they begin to understand this is a real significant issue in the relationship with you and him, you and her, however that may look, in the home, friendships, roommates, all that, best friends. So in other words, set limits in that relationship. Dr. Cloud calls it a property line. You have a property of your life and your emotions and your Uh, your psychological well-being, even physical well-being, mental well-being. He says, consider that your property, and you have property lines that you are now setting, these boundaries that you won't allow this person in and into that yard until they make some adjustments. So, for example, it's you perhaps saying, I won't be yelled at. I won't be yelled at until you are ready to conversate with me being calm. You see how this relates to friendships, parent-children relationships, marriage as well. So again, I won't be yelled at. So I'm setting a boundary here that we'll talk once you're calm. Or how about this one? I'm not going to allow your behavior to impact me. So I'm going to create space and boundaries until you're ready to show that you care and communicate in a caring way. Or how about this? I refuse to be manipulated by you. I will not be manipulated. So I'm going to say no to you when I want to or when I need to, even if you may not like it, until you're ready to really pull out of this illusion of relationship to to deal with each other together. Now, there's some things you want to go around careful, more careful language than, than what I'm expressing, but I'm trying to give you the, a, a bit of a, an understanding and a practical way to, to view things and how you can set that property and how you can set that boundary line in the relationship. So to know your boundaries, set your boundaries. Next, we move on to this. 
which kind of seems a bit contradictory to knowing your boundaries, right? But it's to exercise love. You can still exercise love, even with boundaries. So let's see how this unfolds. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 4, the Apostle Paul wrote there, we spent four weeks on that, pa- that love chapter, that love passage. He says, love is patient, love is kind, and off he runs. So first of all, it's patient. I wish he started with something different there, but he started with patience. Then he says, love is kind. So even if the person is causing unhealth in the relationship, even if that person is reacting wrongly and strongly, they're not calm, all of that, you can still control your reaction, and you can still react with kindness. And so can I. Matter of fact, Romans chapter 2, verse 4, it says that God's kindness leads us to repentance. God's kindness leads us to change. It seems like it would say God's wrath leads us to repentance. God's anger leads us to repentance. No, the superpower is kindness. Shouting or matching the tone with the person in the relationship when they're out of control in their reaction, that's not going to bring repentance or change. No, it's kindness. You exercise love by being kind. Then we also have these other two passages. One out of Proverbs says, Hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all offenses. And then the the Apostle Peter, Pastor Peter, in chapter 4 of this letter, he says, Above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. So let me leave those right there. We're going to come back to get those in a moment. So the question is, Covers, what do you do with love covering? Well, it doesn't mean you deny the offense. It doesn't mean you deny the the sin against you. It doesn't mean you sweep, sweep it under the rug. It doesn't mean you deny your emotions. It doesn't mean you give up your boundaries and let them back on the property even when they're being toxic. No, it doesn't mean that. It means you acknowledge the offense, you acknowledge the sin, but you give wide space to it. You're you're patient, you're kind, and the ultimate is forgiveness. Now that can sound a little bit off because how do you forgive someone who is toxic and reacts to you wrongly and strongly and angrily and and the pain and the wounds that that can come? Well, remember forgiveness at its core is for your freedom, not for their freedom. It's not releasing them, but it is releasing you, this kind of forgiveness to them. It's, it's staying close. It, it, if there's no forgiveness that releases you, then it's going to keep you involved with them emotionally, psychologically. You, you are tied to them. You are in their prison cells. One of our pastors said a while back, unforgiveness is being in a prison cell and giving that person the key. And so you're still psychologically and emotionally in that destructive relationship. But when you forgive and use your own key, the key of Christ to unlock the door, you're the one that's free. You're free from the, more free maybe, from the emotional, psychological, destructive relationship that you're in. So forgiveness is powerful and can be used in such a way to cover over these offenses, to cover over sin. Now, notice it says, it stirs up strife. Hate, hatred stirs up strife. It's always looking for a fight. But love conquers all offenses. It means it's going to make peace, works at peace, makes the effort. All offenses, not all sins, all offenses. It's tolerated. It's not easily provoked. But then notice the Apostle Peter says, above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. Notice it doesn't say that love covers over all sins. That stunned me this week. I really had to wrestle with it. I even talked to Christy about that. I said, what is that? Why does it say that love covers all sins? Because there are repetitive, serious sins that can be committed against you in a relationship that are absolutely lethal. Remember, the forgiveness is to release you, not them, in that sense. And also, here's where uh, one, one biblical counselor, how they put it. We often confuse unconditional love with unconditional relationship. We confuse unconditional love with unconditional relationship. God is gracious to all, but he doesn't have close relationship to all. You see that? I think of Jesus on the cross. What did he say? Father, forgive them, 
for they know not what they do. Just because he forgave them doesn't mean he was close to them. And just because he forgave them didn't bring them close to him. Matter of fact, he was rejected still by many of them, and many of them were, were, were not destined for heaven. They were not believers. So love doesn't cover over... Let me say it the best way this counselor said it. Unconditional love doesn't mean unconditional relationship. God is gracious to all, but he's not in close relationship to all. Powerful. So relationship with no boundaries is not of God. Relationships where you give yourself over to sinful, harmful behavior is not of God. God has not called us to that. He has called us to exercise love and even tough love. Tough love in what way? That there's consequences by creating boundaries and property lines, not to shame the one in, your, in the relationship with, but maybe shake them a bit, to jolt them into how seriously they're, they're behaving and responding and reacting and even treating you. A lot there to think about, but exercise love. And then finally, refuse to give up. There's so much that seems almost contradictory here, doesn't it? I see it with you. But this is the mystery of love, and this is the mystery of pursuing relationships God's way and navigating relationships that, are, that have conflict and trauma and drama. So refuse to give up. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 7 says, Love hopes all things and endures all things. Now, hopefully you, you recognize that doesn't mean you throw out boundaries and all of that, but there is this love, this kindness, this forgiveness, as far as it's up to you, uh, that leads the way. It shows that conflict, drama, confrontation is a spiritual issue at heart. It's, it's spiritual. And love is a spiritual power that can come in as you pray, as you depend upon the Lord, as you abide in Christ for him to move in and through you, to refuse to give up. Here's the way the Apostle Paul wrote it. That might be a principle, I think, that applies. Don't get tired of doing what is good. Don't get discouraged and give up, for we will reap a harvest of blessing at the appropriate time. You can still do good, good with boundaries. You can still move into this principle and trust God to work through the situation when there's boundaries in the relationship. But you pray. At the end of the day, refuse to give up by praying. Love prays. Continue asking God or telling God. I read this in a comment section online. This lady said in a difficult situation, in a difficult relationship, she says, I continue to tell God what I prefer in this relationship. And at the same time, I let him come to me while I wait for his timing and his ways. That's beautifully put. This person is saying they refuse to give up. Listen, if everybody in the family gives up on each other, there's no hope. In the best friendship that you have, the relationship you have, the marriage you have, if you all give up, there is no hope. But if one of you hangs on, just one of you, just one of you refuses to give up with the strength of Christ, there, there is hope. There's hope for reconciliation. There's hope for health that will come. Who knows? Maybe the next step for, for many of you, and I speak to you men, could be therapy. Therapy. That's a big step you can take in your life and in your relationships and even for yourself. So there it is, peacemaker. Where do you see yourself on here? This is a lot to digest. Go this week, dig in, listen to this again, look at your notes, and never forget about drcloud.com if you need more help. And how, how might you apply any of these this week? 2 Corinthians 5.21 says that Jesus is the peacemaker. He who knew no sin became sin so that we may, may be made right with God. And it says in that passage that he might reconcile us to God. God, uh, Jesus went to infinite lengths to get, to get his family back in this love. He refused to give up on you and me. And so maybe in the same way as he reached for us through a nail-scarred hand, even to those who ended up rejecting him, so we can be the same to our families. And maybe you're the one. You're the one right now. Out of everybody in your family or in relation, any relationship, you're the one to take that step to bring reconciliation and re restoration in that relationship. Well, I hope you found this series helpful. I hope today is helpful. There's a lot that came at you. But let the Spirit of God speak to you and give you wisdom about where you step next. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for all who have tuned in, who have joined us, I pray today has been helpful 
Holy Spirit, give us wisdom on how to apply this in whatever areas of our lives and give us courage to do it. Jesus, we bless you and praise you. We remember you and we stand in your love above all. In Jesus' name, amen.